What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. No intro today. Let's just, let's just throw up the rundown and get right into it. First up, iOS 14 released. I don't know if you heard about that, or maybe you heard, uh, which means Swift 5.3, Xcode 12, all that good stuff. So let's talk about Swift 5.3. I'm gonna share a bunch of resources with you. Here's the official announcement. Got a nice little illustration by Amy here. I like when people do this stuff. I don't have the patience to do that with my iPad like during a keynote, but hey, I like it when other people do it. Um, as always, uh, Paul has a playground here. We're gonna check out that here in a second. Um, but here's uh, the main things, as you can see in the list. And again, we'll go over it. I'm not gonna like read them off because it's just a bunch of random stuff, but definitely check this out to dive in. And again, as always, Paul here on GitHub has his what's new in Swift 5.3 playground which I have pulled up here. So again, you can go through like all the major topics. And if you wanna see like how it works in this playground. So let's take multiple trail enclosures uh, as an example here. Paul gives you the nice little intro on what's going on. Uh, just a heads up, if you download this, I had to import SwiftUI, there was errors. I'm not sure what was going on there, but just type import SwiftUI and it'll work. But yeah, if you wanna see how, you know, the multiple trail enclosures, which was a little bit controversial uh, changed, you can see this is like the old way to do it. It can now be written as this. Basically, you don't need these these parentheses, essentially, and like the action. It's just a little bit cleaner. Um, so, and then you can see like you can add uh, this label down here, but he recommends not against having this like floating code. But anyway, you can go through all the uh, the features of Swift 5.3 in this playground to kind of get a feel for it. And then, if you want to know about Swift 5.3 and Swift UI specifically, John Sandel's got you covered how Swift 5.3 enhances Swift UI's uh, DSL. Talk about you know, implicit self-capturing. I, I love this. I actually tweeted this out saying I was gonna pop champagne when I can finally do this because if you've written you know, a lot of Swift UI code uh, past just like playing around, uh, you know that you have self everywhere and it's just like, why, why? Because these are value types, all that good stuff. Um, so in Swift 5.3 and Xcode 12, you're no longer gonna have to have these selves uh, for the most part. Um, and, and John talks about that, talks about how uh, view building, function builders, you can now have like switch statements and stuff uh, in the function builder. So all the Swift 5.3 stuff pertinent to Swift UI, John's got you covered. And then I don't have it out yet, but later this week, I'm gonna have a what's new in Swift 5.3 video. So be on the lookout for that. I already have my what's new in Xcode video. I'll link to that in the description. You can check that out as well. Next up, we have an awesome story uh, about David Smith, independent developer. He's been around forever, uh, co-host of the podcast, Under the Radar. Been following him since I first started. So it's great to see this. He created an app called Widget Smith and, you know, he didn't plan on this happening. I don't think anybody saw this coming, but basically it went viral on TikTok, which he says he would never thought he would say, <laughs> basically. So he didn't even do it, right? It's not like this was part of his marketing plan. Uh, essentially this TikTok right here, uh, a woman is, is showing how she used Widget Smith to like customize her home screen. And you can see right here, it's got 3.2 million likes. I think last I checked, it was at like 17 million views. So it like really blew up, went viral on TikTok. And what happened was, and you see this David Smith tweet here, he says, I'm speechless, genuinely never thought I'd ever see this, literally too much happening for his brain. It shot up to the top of the free app charts, not a category, like the whole charts. Like you can see TikTok, it's above TikTok, it's above YouTube. Um, so really awesome story, great to see uh, that happened to David. And, and in hindsight, like, well, well one, I don't wanna speak for David. I imagine he didn't see this coming, obviously. Um, but just to, you know, he kind of thought that widgets might be a thing that people would wanna customize. So he created a tool for it. The tool blew up and, and it's, it's actually like going viral all over here, right? So everybody's like customizing their home screen and they're going very, very far with it. I'm sure you've seen this on Twitter, but in case you haven't, you can check out some cool images here. So you can uh, basically, you know, with the widget Smith, you can create your own widgets, but you can create little spacers too. I think, you know, I think that's just in shortcuts. You don't necessarily need widget Smith, but people are creating like really cool looking like home, not even home screens, just overall organized app screens, right? And I really like how people are doing this, for example, uh, this one's pretty cool. This is nice and clean. Uh, sorry for the quality of the image, but I like how they took the time to create their own icons. Cause if you use shortcuts in combination with all this, you can basically create a shortcut to open up an app and then you can give that shortcut its own image icon. So you can totally customize everything. And like this person took the time to create their own icons for everything. So everything matched. And then this woman here, she took it very far. Like look how like all theme color coordinated like it she went real far with it but you can see how cool you can make your home screen look and to be honest with you like 
I don't think Apple, like, I don't know if they intended for this to happen, or maybe they thought this could potentially happen with the combination of widgets and, and shortcuts, but hey, here we are. And then of course, right, people are taking their phone and, and turning it into a uh, Windows 95. This is good for a laugh, I think it's funny. I don't know if I could look at my phone every day like this, right? Uh, anyway, to each their own, but that was the, the nice David Smith and Widget Smith story. Um, it's just awesome to see independent developers like blowing up like that, good stuff. Next up, let's talk about grids. That's another big new thing in iOS 14 with SwiftUI. And here by Javier, the SwiftUI lab, uh, we have a nice article, the impossible grids. We get this nice honeycomb grid. And basically, if you wanna just really up your, your game with grids, this is an amazing article because you go through all kinds of crazy stuff with grids, like the basics, like what, what lazy is, how that all works, just, it's a really long article, but you're really gonna do a deep dive on grids. I'm scrolling fast because I wanna get to this movie uh, or video towards the end, but you can kind of see how in-depth you go in this grid stuff. So if you're building a grid as like the main part of your app, definitely check this out. But this is pretty cool here, we're getting to it. Uh, the honeycomb grid, right? Shows you how to make this. And if you watch this video, uh, it's pretty cool. You can see how you can animate, you can do really cool stuff with SwiftUI. You can morph it into the square and you can see just all the cool like animations you can do. But again, if you wanna just do the deep dive on grids and really up your game, here you go. And to wrap up the SwiftUI section, we have uh, Peter Steinberger here with the state of SwiftUI. If you're not familiar with Peter, big name in the iOS space, been around forever, very, very knowledgeable. Um, he really breaks down his deep dive into SwiftUI because he started doing the deep dive. He took Apple's uh, example app, dove into that. He took uh, Thomas Ricard's uh, Reddit iOS app, did a deep dive on that. And uh, if you really want to get into the weeds, like with uh, all the system crashes, how it converts to AppKit, uh, performance, you know, he opens up instruments and really dissects the performance down here on like why things are, are slower in SwiftUI. Um, so if you really want to break all that down, definitely check this out, go into the, do the deep dive here. This is basically talking about the, the detriments of SwiftUI, but he does to say here, uh, the good news is, is there seems to be a lot of potential for future optimizations, right? Possible to make this fast. Alternatively, there's always a possibility of dropping out of SwiftUI, meaning like if you need to drop down to U, uh, UI kit or app kit, like you don't have to use SwiftUI, you can mix and match uh, in your app, right? If SwiftUI is just not cutting it for a screen, drop down to UI kit, drop down to app kit uh, to take care of it. But anyway, back to the conclusion uh, here. Uh, basically he says, uh, you know, if you're, if you can target iOS 14, you know, you're good to go with hobby projects or individual screens. Uh, he says he wouldn't personally go all in with the Swift UI for production apps, uh, although the crash rate is likely manageable and Apple's like actively improving this, right? This is still very, very early uh, in Swift UI's life. Um, but basically, you know, other ports are not so great. AppKit seems particularly troublesome. Essentially, it's not fully ready for prime time, but he does say, you know, if you're curious about SwiftUI, big bold, right? Please don't let this dampen your enthusiasm. It's extremely fun to write, agreed. Uh, and it's clearly the future of Apple, agreed. Uh, and all these issues will surely be resolved within a few years. And it's always nice to see like other, you know, developers and get other perspectives and how, you know, other people are seeing SwiftUI and what their thoughts are. Next up, let's talk about force unwrapping optionals in an article here, the danger of playing it safe. Now we're, we're all familiar with, with force unwrapping optionals, right? And, and you hear multiple camps of developers, right? Some developers say never force unwrap, like, you know, uh, unwrap all the optionals. And anytime there's like an absolute in programming or, or somebody has that absolute opinion, like I always shy away from that because there's almost certainly like, exceptions or, or maybe they're taking that too far. Uh, and that's kind of what this article is about. Like, cause I fall in that camp. I, I do say yes, unwrap 90% of your optionals, right? But there's that 10% where, I don't know, I just feel like it's it's more detrimental to go through the hassle of like unwrapping and makes your code, you know, less readable, more verbose, more cluttered. And that's what this article, you know, goes on to discuss, right? You know, first my reasoning, I think you should force unwrap in any situation where logic tells you that an optional simply cannot be nil. You know, an example might look like this, right? Where you declare the value and then on the very next line, you use that value, right? So like, it's not gonna be nilled there. Um, you know, he does say perhaps in some strange memory corruption, it could be, but he also brings up the point that, you know, if sometimes crashing is not a bad thing, like don't be afraid of a crash, right? Because he says like, if for some reason that did happen and that count ended up being nil, in this, in this hypothetical example, by the way, you know, the app could end up in an undefined weird state, which could be dangerous and could mess up other things in your app. So like crashing is actually probably what you wanna do uh, in that state. So, and again, this touches on the readability thing, right? For 
you know, for force unwrapped optionals that are like absolutely, you know, 99.9999% going to be there. Like, you know, going through this whole dance makes your code cluttered, verbose, hard to read. And he talks about intentions. Like it, it disguises the developer intentions. Like when you do this force unwrap, it says to the next developer, like count could conceivably be nil. So we'll check for it. And it kind of gives you clues on like how you built this feature. Whereas when you do the force unwrap, you're you're sending the message to the next developer, again, provided you're all working on this assumption that you're not just lazily force unwrapping optionals because you don't want to do it, right? If you're, if you're working under the assumption that, hey, hey team, developer team, we're going to force unwrap optionals when we believe it's like 99.99% going to be there, right? If that's like your understanding, then you know you're, you're sending the message to the next developer that like, hey, I don't expect this to be no ever, so that's why I force unwrapped. Whereas when you do the whole uh, optional unwrap dance, you're, you're sending the message that like, hey, this could conceivably be nil. So, you know, it's a little, can get a little messy there. But I mean, moral of the story, I'm just a believer that yes, 90% of the time you should unwrap your optionals, but there are plenty of situations where force unwrapping um, is perfectly fine. But again, a bigger moral of the story is anytime somebody has like an absolute opinion, like always do this, never do that. Like it's just, I don't know, there's probably always exceptions. Moving on to the Twitter wisdom portion of the show here. We have Lee. I thought this was kind of funny, but also like good wisdom because I know a lot of people out there earlier in their career, uh, developer priorities throughout their career. And it's a nice graph. And we'll we'll start with the blue one, the code readability, because we were just talking about that a little bit. Um, so you see the blue, they start off down here, but then they go into this valley of elite hacker you noob, right? In that like three to six year experience range. And we I've talked about this before. That's where you kind of like, you start to know enough that you want to show off your knowledge. So you start writing this crazy, terse, concise code, single little variables. Like, look, I wrote all this in one line of code or three lines of code, but it's like so confusing to work with and read and only you know what it does. Like that's the valley of the elite hacks or noob. So hopefully you're not there, but eventually you come out of that valley and you start stressing like code readability and I think I skipped this valley, to be honest with you. I don't know, I probably dipped into it for a little bit. Definitely didn't spend years in there, but I jumped on this code readability train very early in my career. Basically, as soon as I worked on a code base with another developer and I had to read their code and vice versa, they had to read my code, like that's when I jumped on the code readability train because I was like, this it's a nightmare trying to read somebody else's code sometimes. Um, but that's just readability. And then back to the dry principle, Right when you first start off as a beginner, you're just repeating yourself always, and then you you develop into this don't repeat yourself ever, and you start refactoring every little thing and all these little components, and you you kind of like over optimize, right? And then you kind of come back down to like, yeah, repeating yourself is fine sometimes, right? Because you've been through that experience of over refactoring and making things more confusing than helpful when just repeating yourself once made things so much clearer. <laughs> and then I thought this last one was funny. Does it actually work? Eh. And the more experience you get, you're like, mm, I, I guess. Um, that's, that's a nice little chart, Twitter wisdom. Again, it's you're going to go through a journey of your career where your opinions are going to change and evolve over time. And again, I think this chart shows that beautifully. Next, we have uh, Nick Lockwood talking about, uh, he was just talking about wartime versus peacetime thinking. This is a big thing. And like, I'm not saying this is where Nick got it. This is where I've heard it before too, is like, you know, startup CEOs, right? You have wartime CEOs and peacetime CEOs, right? And coming from the world of startups, I can relate to this because I've always worked at smaller startups, you know, three to 10 to 20 people where like your runway, your, your burn rate, all that good stuff. Like, you know, you're going to run out of money in six months. So like you have to make stuff happen now, you know? So that would be like, quote unquote, maybe that's not full on wartime. Wartime's when like shit's really hitting the fan, but it's not peacetime where you have two years to build this feature, you know? Um, but this is kind of in, uh, in a response to this tweet. Don't, don't worry about that. That's kind of into the whole, like how everybody on Twitter is so easily, if they're just like waiting around to be offended, I don't want to get into all that, but that's, he does bring it towards development. And that's what I want to talk about. Right. Uh, in wartime, you have to do whatever is expedient to solve the problems quickly. Right. There are these aren't always good long term solutions. And sometimes you make mistakes that you pay for later. Right. Everything's a trade off. Like sometimes you have to be like, I am writing hacky spaghetti code, but this feature has to go out tomorrow. I don't have time to whiteboard, whiteboard my architecture, plan it out, write all the unit. Te you know, I don't have time for that. Like it has to go out now. And that's what he's talking about. Right. In peacetime, you can take the time to bike shed stuff that seems trivial and do things the right way. Uh, when, you have, when you have a week to deliver a critical feature, the ability to ship something quickly that works is paramount, even if you cut architectural corners and maybe don't add as many unit tests as you should have. But again, use this sparingly. You can't always develop like that. Like you said, it's behaving that way all the time. Like that makes you a liability, right? There's a time for both. And 
the really why I wanted to point this out is, you know, you hear all kinds of developer opinions on Twitter, right? And the way I think about that is everybody's opinion is coming from the situation they were in, right? Some developers like myself have like only worked in startups where you have to get things out fast, right? Other developers have only worked at large fang companies where you have all the time in the world, right? To, to do things, you got to go through meetings on just to change a small little thing. Like it's, it's a different world. And I'm not saying one's better than the other or one's right, one's wrong. Just keep in mind that when these opinions come at you, they may be coming from a completely different world that you're in. And like I said, you do have to be careful with this. We just talked about that, right? Somebody who's making wartime decisions in peacetime you're, you're not applying the right mindset, right? And vice versa, right? If you're making peacetime decisions in wartime, it's probably not gonna work out. So you have to know when to use which kind of like mindset. So uh, again, I just, I liked, um, again, the peacetime wartime thing, I've heard about it before, but I like how Nick uh, frames this and talks about that in, in software development. Up next, we have the design portion of the show from App Figures, uh, how to design screenshots that result in downloads. Um, real quick tips on your, your screenshots. Here's the list, Green, good screenshots, more downloads, good stuff. I wanna point out one major thing though. Um, you know, they need to talk about more, definitely check out the article, but I wanna talk about like the, the philosophy uh, behind a, a good screenshot. It says your, your screenshot should answer the question like, is this app what I need, right? Don't, so I guess the point is like, don't, you know, just show off your, your cool screens, right? The best way to help people choose your app is to show them they get what they want, right? Don't just show off your login screen or your cool splash screen with a logo. Like here's Reddit, you know, dive into anything. And, and you, you do show some cool screenshots, but you can use the other screenshots to really promote the value that your app provides, right? So don't be lazy and just, you know, throw up three cool looking screens, you know, like really sell the user to download. And this is how you just drive more downloads, right? Add contrast. And then they show a bunch of different examples, right? TikTok, YouTube, this game, whatever that is. Um, and like, look, these ones don't even like really show a screen. Um, so the, the, the idea is to like really take advantage of your, your app store screenshots because you've downloaded apps, right? You've been on the other side. You've been the consumer. The, the screenshots in the app preview, the video, at least to me, like I judge it just on that. Like I don't read the description or anything else. So anyway, the screenshots are very important. And this article from App Figures gives you uh, some nice tips on how to improve yours. And finally, the LOL of the week. <laughs> At least it made me laugh. Um, this could also be wrapped up in Twitter wisdom, I guess. But James Thompson here, uh, very uh, prominent uh, indie developer of PCALC, you may have heard of him, um, developers, right? You don't need to be ready for day one. Just take your time and get it right. It's 2020, cut yourself some slack, prioritize your mental health, right? We, we see this all over developer Twitter, work-life balance, mental health, right? But then you also see a ton of developers, boom, day one losers, right? And this is in reference to how Apple just dropped iOS 14, like, hey, it's releasing tomorrow. And a lot of developers had to frantically, you know, work all night to get their apps ready for iOS 14 and submitted and launched. Um, so it's just, it, it's just funny. Um, and I'm not attacking anybody. This is not like a, a sub tweet, like whatever. My, my take on Twitter, like, I think Twitter's amazing for sharing knowledge, uh, you know, just being able to just discover people, share knowledge, share what you're working on. But when it comes to like opinions on how to live your life, like work-life balance or hard work, like, Take those with a heavy, heavy grain of salt, right? Because everybody's life is different, right? Some people are married with kids. Some people are single. Like, don't, there's no blanket advice, right? If you didn't want to go nuts on the iOS 14 release and you wanted to just preserve your mental health, you don't want to stress, great, awesome. If you wanted to bust your ass and work all night and get it out for launch day, good for you, awesome. Like, just do you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't, don't let the whole Twitter, like, opinions, like, dictate your life too much, I guess. So, LOL kind of turned into Twitter wisdom a little bit, but I literally laughed out loud when I saw this tweet because it was, it was nice and timely. It was, it was pretty funny. Anyway, that wraps it up for this week's episode. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.